I'd like to call the meeting of the Board of Education oh, for you. November the 4th to order. We do have a quorum. Is Dr. Frederick joining us? I'd like to ask that we have a moment of silence now. At this time, I'd like to ask Rep uh, Board Member Hayes to do the Pledge of Allegiance and lead us in that. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this time, we will look at item 201 on our agenda. This is if we need to make any changes to the agenda. Do we have any changes that need to be made at this time? If not, we need a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. Motion to adopt the agenda. Second. Motion's been made and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. At this time, we will ask Dr. Winborn for his superintendent's report. Well, good evening, Madam Chair, board members, team members, and those community members in attendance, and those joining via video. This evening, I'd like to share two exciting updates with everyone. First, artificial intelligence. I'm sure many of you have heard the buzz about AI and the potential that it has to transform our lives. Uh, it certainly has impacted us in the classroom, many teachers um, are contending with AI, um, particularly with those tech-savvy secondary students. <laughs> but uh, wh while AI can, can be used to cheat and it can be used for plagiarizing and to cut corners academically, it can also be used as a very powerful tool for learning. And that's why I am pleased to announce that Granville County Public Schools now has its very own artificial intelligence task force. And this group uh, was put together with the leadership of our Director of Technology, Mr. Ernie Connor. Um, it's comprised of about 30 or so educators from across our school district. Um, Mr. Connor applied for and received a grant to fund this endeavor. Um, and so we have teachers, counselors, social workers, school nurses, and administrators um, have joined the cause. And they started by giving up their Saturday this past weekend uh, for their first meeting. And they, they're coming together and tackling this issue of AI and how we can leverage this to help our kids. Um, they will continue to meet throughout the school year um, they're going to be gathering the latest information about AI. Of course, it's a rapidly evolving and changing um, issue with the to new tools coming out every day. Um, but they're going to be, you know, considering this information and begin to establish some procedures, some practices, and some guidelines. And then they're going to go back and train their colleagues in, their, in, in each of the schools. Um, so I'm very excited about this work. I think it's cutting edge. I think it's very forward-looking. And again, I want to thank Mr. Connor for his leadership on this. Um, I think it's really easy to underestimate just how impactful AI could be in our work, particularly with education. It, it has transformed. For those of you that have paid much attention to it, it, has, it is growing in its power exponentially. Um, and it's changing. The, the types of things that you can do with AI are changing dramatically um, in short periods of time. So um, we need to pay attention to this as a school district 
and I feel confident that we have a, a real top-notch group working on this and um, I, I look forward to bringing the board more information about their work as this continues. Uh, the next thing I want to share uh, that's good news with you about is apprenticeships. And I'll give a little shout out to Ms. Hazel because I know her son is a proud uh, participant in, in the apprenticeship program. But uh, this past week, I took my second trip up to Surrey County near Mount Airy, North Carolina to visit a factory owned by Alltech. And um, the site there in Mount Airy is the sister plant or, or factory of one of the same, that the same company runs in Creedmoor, just next door to Granville Early College in Vance Granville. And they make the large uh, bucket trucks that serve electrical lines and, and do tree trimming and that sort of thing. But it's a global business. Um, it's, a, it's a very large company. And I went to, to visit their factory in Mount Airy to see firsthand a highly successful work-based learning program that Surrey County Public Schools, the Surrey County Community College, and that Alltech factory have um, for apprenticeships. So I want you to think about it this way. Basically, a, a high school student uh, near the end of their time in high school, maybe their junior or senior year, they could apply for what's called a pre-apprenticeship. And you can sort of think about this as a, as a temporary job, but a, a job with importance and a job that could lead to big opportunities. And then once they complete that pre-apprenticeship, if it goes well, the student can then apply for a full-blown apprenticeship. And this is a program that's licensed through the North Carolina Department of Labor, and it leads to a journeyman certificate. Um, and it also um, allows the student to get full-time pay while they're doing that apprenticeship earn a two-year degree for free with the promise of a, a full-time um, job at the end of that, a well-paying position with a, a career track in that company. So I mean, you can imagine being, if you graduate when you're 18 years old, by the time you're 20, 21 years old, you're going to have a two-year degree under your under your belt that's paid for, that you got for free, you will have been working and earning good wages during that time, and you will have a job making forty, fifty, or even sixty thousand dollars a year waiting for you. Part as part of like a highly skilled workforce we're talking about too, with a career track. And all tech is just one of many routes um, that these apprenticeships could take. Uh, it's not just advanced manufacturing, but you see this now happening in healthcare, so maybe Granville Health Systems could be part of this apprenticeship program. Um, the, tr the skilled trades with our HVAC, electrical and plumbing, I think. We have a lot of local companies that are excited about this. Technology, cybersecurity, programming, et cetera. Or really, any industry that would be willing to join us on this could, could um, help create these pathways for our students. So our plan is that uh, working with Vance Granville, who will be the sponsor of these internships, we will begin working with Alltech first, um, and we're going to have our first pre-apprenticeships this spring. And we're going to work to bring other industry partners in on the summer and following school year. So I'm, I'm very excited about this opportunity for our students. I, I believe it's a game changer and a, a promising uh, pathway for a lot of our kids. So. Um, I look forward to sharing more with you in presentations at future board meetings. Dr. Winborn, I have one question. Yes. What was the funding amount for the grant that Mr. Connor received for the AI? Uh, Mr. Connor, can I put you on the spot? I think it was $50,000. Yeah, a nice, a nice grant. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Lindsay, for that. <coughs> um, finally, just to conclude my remarks, I'd like to once again acknowledge the difficult decisions that our board members are facing regarding school reorganization. Um, it, I know it weighs heavily on, on all of us. And uh, once again, I would ask for everyone's patience and understanding and support. Please remember that our, our board members genuinely have the best interests of all of our students at heart. And I, for one, am grateful of your commitment and your courage, board members, um, to do what is needed. So thank you, and I look forward to a productive meeting this evening. Thank you, Dr. Winborn.
that's always something exciting that you have to tell us, it seems. It's new and promising, so we appreciate your hard work on that. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight that's in present, as well as those joining us by live stream. We do have a difficult decision we will be wrestling with this evening, and we appreciate your remarks about how hard it is to make decisions, but we all have to keep in mind the good of our students. Um, as for me, I have been busy attending committee meetings, HR policy, operations, academic, I may have missed one, but what I'd like to say about that is our people are working so hard on these committees and it's truly appreciated having the kind of input that we get because not any one person has all the answers. So it's always good to see people work together to try to find good things that we can do and challenges that we can meet. I'd also like to thank our administrative staff who always provides us with the information we need and the information we oftentimes request that they didn't know we wanted. But they are always willing to give us what we need and it's always helpful. So we thank you for that. And last, uh, Dr. Winborn, myself, and Ms. Hines, we attended on October, um, yeah, October 17th, um, a liaison meeting set up with county commissioners. And I would just like to say we were able to discuss some of the challenges ahead for our school system and some of our needs. And it was a very productive meeting and we really appreciate the relationship that we've been building with our county commissioners so that when we go to them and they come to us that we can have good dialogue and good results for our school system. And that concludes my remarks for tonight. Now we will have reports from other board members. Mr. Peace. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, <clears throat> As chair of the operations committee, we had a meeting on uh, October 23rd, and uh, we have a lot of projects going on that's uh, being done. I, I want to thank you to the maintenance department and the head of that operation for all of the work that they are doing to uh, prepare facilities and make things more pleasurable for children to do athletics, especially at this point. Uh, and uh, the uh, operation committee is heavily involved in dealing with consolidation as it pertains to buildings that we are kind of uh, responsible for. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when the time arrived on the program, but right now uh, we, our meeting consisted of part of that as it relates to uh, transportation, but we'll have all of that discussion a little later in the program today. Thank you. Ms. Lebrecht? Yes, um, so I attended the Finance and Academic Committee um, this past month, and um, I don't really have much to say, but one of, one of the things that's actually in our consent items, um, 4.02, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, I just wanted to um, bring that to people's attention, letting them know that that is a <coughs> survey that will be coming out in the spring, and they do have the potential to opt out of that. So just wanted to kind of highlight that, because I don't know that we're really going to be discussing it in great depth today, so thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Lindsay. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Um, I'd like to say that I've, uh, we had our hearing, but public hearing meeting at, at Grandma Center a few weeks ago. I see now why we have to have a meeting that here for my public here. Because I heard things I was not really aware of. I heard a lot of passion for their school, their faculty and staff, their camaraderie, um, distance, all those things that as we sit here, we can't hear what they're saying out there in our community here. So I'm glad I was able to hear that and hear some of your concerns. But I guess tonight here we will make a decision based on what's best for the total good for the ground account as a whole here. Some things are completely out of our control when it comes to finances, our schools be uh, at efficiency, uh, things of that nature here. But I hope that in this meeting here, 
you all would still support Grand Island County Public Schools because we need your support so we can go forward here and make things good for the students here in Grand Island County. I did attend the academic meeting on um, two weeks ago. As you four here said that we did discuss the risk uh, survey. I heard some things also about Discovery Ed, um, lab demos, AIG, which this also is growing here in Granville County, and those kids, so opportunities to have more challenging curriculum in their classrooms, and also how much they have grown over the years as well. Uh, I also attended the meeting that Ms. Rice well, is chairing here, our School Health Advisory Committee meeting that we met our first time a few weeks ago, which that means based trying to build a very healthy child here that will be able to thrive uh, long term what we feel will be what we call long-term success for them to grow and to thrive in a very changed society. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Anderson? Yes, thank you. Um, a lot that uh, my uh, comrades just mentioned with regards to what I have been attending as well. Um, that is the finance committee meeting, the academic committee meeting a couple of weeks ago, and also the policy uh, committee meeting. Uh, which I know we will definitely be discussing or talking a little bit on our agenda a little bit later, and also the public hearing. And I agree with Dr. Lindsay with regards to, you know, just listening to our uh, folks uh, talk, the community that came in and spoke with regards to, you know, the uh, impending decisions that has to be made. So uh, I did hear the folks when they spoke about what they, you know, how they felt. And yes, we are looking to do what's in the best interest of the entire Grandma County public school system. Uh, one of the final things that I did attend and I really enjoyed it was the meet and greet session for the beginner teachers. Uh, I did have, uh, love just talking to them and, you know, just having discussions with them where they're teaching at and, you know, places that they have come from to come here to teach. It was a great section and I enjoyed talking with everyone. Thank you. Ms. Hayes. <clears throat> um, I had a, the opportunity to attend quite a few things um, this month. Uh, South Grenville homecoming football game. Um, I think their last game is this Friday, so I wish them the best of luck. Um, eighth grade boys soccer night at Holly. I think they were the champions. They were undefeated in the regular season, um, but they were runner up to a Butner Stem Middle School who were tournament champions. So congratulations to both middle schools. Um, so they both had really great seasons. Uh, I also attended last week's um, North Carolina School Board Association webinar that they had on the NIL, so name, image, and likeness uh, who knows, I mean, we could, we could be dealing with that at some point, you know, those changes. And then um, I'm, I think there's another one on Thursday that I'm signed up for, and I think it's open to any other board members. Um, so, you know, if you have time on Thursday morning, look into it. I always get really great policy information from their, uh, from their webinars. Um, and this was in place of the fall um, law conference that got canceled um, that was supposed to be held in Asheville. So, uh, I also attended a couple different committees, um, policy operations and HR, but I did want to tell you guys that we're going to plan a legislative committee meeting for this month. Um, Ms. Shave did send me an email earlier, <laughs> just a few minutes before the meeting. So for those of you on policy, I think we're going to aim for the 20th, um, either before or right after the meeting. Uh, and this is to talk about um, teacher pay. Um, hopefully, we're gonna we're gonna craft either a letter or a resolution for the board to support um, a raise, and so hopefully, you know, you guys will come and give input on that. Uh, I also had the pleasure of meeting with um, Olivia Oxendine, who is one of the representatives from the State Board of Education, and talked with her quite a bit about our legislative agenda um, that we crafted last year. So that was really amazing. Um, I did not realize that the state board was actually already talking about revisions to the ESL program. So that was really great conversation. I also talked about uh, other things like master's pay, um, EC, <laughs> teacher's pay, you know, all the things at the top of the list. Uh, so yeah, um, I did have Q&A sessions with a few staff members from some of the schools in my district. And 
got some really great feedback from them on closure and consolidation, and I'm hoping that I will be able to bring that tonight during our conversations. So, that's it. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. I'd like to remind the public that our committee meetings are open to the public, and they are noticed, and in our board docs each monthly meeting, we do have copies of the minutes. So we like to be transparent about all of our business that we conduct. Okay, now is the time for public comment. Madam Chair and board members, you have one <laughs> digital public comment. Uh, I did send it to you via email, but you also have a paper copy in your um, folders. And we have two people who have signed up for public comment tonight. So just, just as a reminder, each speaker will receive no more than five minutes to present comments. However, the public comment session will not exceed 30 minutes total, except by a majority vote of the board. Speakers will be recognized in the order in which they signed in. Substitute speakers will not be permitted, and speakers, speakers may not donate any portion of their time to another speaker. If a speaker is unable to present all of his or her information within the specified time limit, the speaker may provide the board with the additional information in written form. Board members will not respond to individuals who address the board except to request clarification of points made by the presenter. The laws and policies of North Carolina provide that issues or concerns involving individual personnel matters are confidential and therefore not appropriate for public comment settings. Concerns related to personnel issues may be addressed through applicable GCPS personnel, the grievance policy, or other applicable policies. Profane or vulgar language or personal abuse against any individual will not be permitted. So our first speaker tonight is Morelli Martinez, and the topic is school closing. Good evening, everybody. Oh, my name is Morelli Martinez, and I'm proud to say I'm a junior at uh, Granville Central High School. Why you wanna close our school? out of every other school you got, doesn't make sense to us. If you're to move us yourself, Granville, it's already crowded. We, don't, we won't feel welcome being forced for juniors or senior. It wouldn't even make sense. I want you to ask the teachers and interview them. Do you think our school is built for a middle school? All of them said no. It's not built, and it will never be built as a middle school. What will happen to the self-confinement con students? Will they, get their, will they get their own hallway, their own classrooms, their own bathrooms like they do at Granville Central High School? We got one of the best principals there, Dr. Allen. We don't want to get we don't want to leave her. We, we make friendship with the teachers. We don't, we don't, I don't want to let that go, or we don't want to let that go. We can prove we make history. Each year, it's, it's a new history in the yearbook. I just want to say, I'm, a pr uh, I'm proud to be a panther, and I'm just trying to finish as a panther, but you guys are, are preventing that by trying to close down our school, by forcing us to, to become Vikings and warriors, something we will not be, and something we can never be, because we are probably panthers. Thank you. The next speaker is Nicholas Henley. 7.01 school reorganization is the topic. All right, good afternoon and welcome uh, school board members. Greetings members of the board and central office staff. I come to you again to plead the case of Granville Central High School's building remaining a high school. My belief, as you know, is that it should remain a high school. My comments tonight and links to back up what I say can be found at bit.ly slash GCHS vigil. Let's get to it. I believe the one high school model is achievable with work and funding, but it cannot be done quickly. 
which is why this timeline has been so pressing since August. The district is financially stressed, and a decision must be reached, and soon. But I wanted to come tonight to plead with you to make the best choice as you deliberate on that decision. As I speak tonight, let me define some things first so we'll all understand we're on the same page. This can be confusing. So if I refer to a school by its acronym, I am referring to its physical building or site. If I refer to it by its full name, I'm referencing the entity of the school. For example, let's use it in a sentence. Last year, the school board closed Creedmoor Elementary and moved G.C. Hawley Middle to CES. Hopefully that example makes sense. Now, having said that, let me say what I did not have the time to say at the public comment night on October 21st, which is what I said here on September 9th, which was the option that I thought was truly the most viable. Modify David Richardson's original proposal move South Granville High School to the uh, campus of GCHS, and then move the middle schools to the campus currently known as SGHS. But the big change is this, close the school entity that is known as Granville Central High, my school. This was originally scenario B in the June 2021 study. Think about it, you get to close Granville Central High School, which is what you've been wanting to do. South Granville gets an upgrade in facility, which I believe is something you want to do too. It seems to me to be a win-win situation. I know we're missing some athletic facilities at, South, at GCHS. Build them. We have room. We're missing an auditorium. Well, if you did as Richardson motioned, the middle schools would all have auditoriums. And guess what? You could still add one at the GCHS site. Sure, that costs money, but do the county commissioners really want to spend money on new construction or remodeling the old stuff? What about the legacy of South Granville High? You wouldn't be closing the school. You'd be upgrading it to a facility that can grow with the school. South Granville will no longer be landlocked and can expand, something which is not possible at SGHS. Today, I had the privilege of speaking briefly with several representatives from ECU. We were discussing the teacher cadet class, which I am honored to have the opportunity to teach. And I told them that my school was potentially being shut down tonight by the school board, so I may be in a different facility this time next year, just so they would know. They looked at me in disbelief. They commented how nice a building GCHS was. It's obvious to others that GCHS should remain a high school building. The North Carolina School Board Association lists that one of the primary duties of the local school board, specifically number five, is in providing adequate school facilities. You cannot tell me that someone from another county or the state level would come here, do an independent study, look at the three high school buildings we have, and come to the conclusion that's been studied. That the newest and nicest facility with the cleanest bathrooms, the largest gym and larger cafeteria, the most student parking, the most available land, which is not in the current study, but I have links in the link here, bit.ly slash GCHS vigil, for any need experience and of course the state-of-the-art CTE wing and workshop um, we are with workshops should be closed and turned to a middle school with consolidation will trailers be an added expense at any of these schools will additional classrooms need to be literally imported I didn't see that discussed in the study but if this is done at SGHS would there be room how about at web what about the number of classrooms I see the study claims we have 11 vacant classrooms at GCHS out of 58 classrooms I did my own counting I have a link for that as well and while not perfect as I has been pushed for time one minute. I understand fully with the crazy numbering system that's at my school, it's not an easy task to count the rooms. It's not. But the best count I could come up with was maybe six or seven vacant rooms and only 38 in total. Some of the rooms are really just half a room, a conference room, a resource room, little space. What about rooms for the self-contained students? Do other students, um, schools have adequate facilities to house them? There's so many questions that need asking, and I don't see that they're in the study. I've heard the workshops on the CTE wing were counted as potential classrooms. Those rooms have to be inspected. They were built for a purpose. I, from my understand, they have to be redone because they're considered exit points for safety and cannot be used as classrooms. Have the fire inspectors been consulted in the studies? I don't see them referenced in the sources of the study. What about the weight room? I've heard it said the students had to be 15 years of age to take it, but I've looked and I honestly couldn't find it definitive documentation on that. Most commercial gyms do not allow younger students with or younger children without parental supervision. And while a middle school weight room could would have to have a properly trained teacher in order to mitigate any potential physical injuries, thank you all for your time. I wish you the best of luck with your decision. That concludes public comment. Thank you.
Okay, next we will have um, 305, which are the first read of from the policy committee. Uh, now I'm going to turn that over to our board attorney. Absolutely. <clears throat> the policies for first reading are from our 8,000 series, which is the district's fiscal policies. And um, all of these updates came from updates provided by the School Board Association policy service that the board subscribes to. and. Most are either formatting and, and grammar updates or some legal updates, but there were no changes in this round that represent any sort of significant change in practice at the school system level. Um, so the policy committee has reviewed these, made some revisions, and now presents them to you for, at first reading. This has been presented as a first read. Do we have any comments or questions is there anyone that wants to adopt them on a first read okay you making a motion to that effect do we have a second second okay motion's been made in second to adopt these policies as first read and forego a second read all in favor Aye. Aye. all opposed motion passes Next, we have consent items. More policies. We're almost through with the policy manual, as I understand it. We have a little bit more to go. The policies here were discussed at the September 24th board meeting, and this is the second read. Do we have any cons comments or questions or discussion? Do we have a motion? May I move that we accept all consent items as listed? Second. Motion's been made and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. The next item under consent is the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. That is a consent item. All right, and the next thing on there is roof replacement for Butner Stem Middle School and 404 field trip approval. So we can get a motion for all of these at once or if anyone prefers to do differently, that's fine too. I believe that's what I did whenever I made my motion. Yes. It was for all four items. Okay, thank you. Have a sec. Okay. Next is academic success. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Perry. Um, had a death in the family and was unable to be here this evening. But uh, members of his team uh, will be stepping up uh, to share the information tonight. Uh, Dr. Felicia Whitaker and Mrs. Amy Rice. Uh, ladies, if you would uh, take us away and lead us through the presentation. We're in very capable hands. Thank you. Good evening, board, Dr. Winborn, parents and community members. We have a few academic updates that we would like to share with you this evening. Next slide. So just as a reminder, we want to go over again what our academic goals for this school year are. We are focusing on high student engagement, rigorous assessments and benchmarks, and strong PLCs. And it is our goal that by the end of this school year, 50% or more of at least 50% of our schools will have a school performance letter grade of a C, and they will meet or exceed expected growth. Next slide. So again, we're going to give you ac um, academics information, attendance, and behavior. 
So tonight we want to come before you to discuss our low performing schools and on the screen you will see the definition of a low performing school that is given to us by general <coughs> statute. Um, low performing schools or schools are designated as low performing on an annual basis and schools who have a school performance grade of a D or F and the school either met or it met expected growth or met exceeded growth but they have a D or F will be determined or designated as a low performing school. Next slide. So here we are with our state designation timeline. For schools that are designated as low performing, there are several things that the state requires us to do. So the timeline began in October 3rd when the list of low performing schools was shared with um, school districts. And so we've already taken care of October 3rd. That was um, something that Dr. Winborn had to do uh, as far as personnel is concerned. We're now in our first 30 days. So the, what we need to do now is present our preliminary district improvement plan to you, the board, which is what we've done previously. We've talked to you about how we want to improve our schools earlier in the year, but we've also put that plan into IndyStar, and so we're sharing it now. We have 30 days from um, tomorrow until the 1st of December to receive public comment on our district improvement plan. So parents in the community will be able to go to our district plan and they will be able to provide feedback with the Google survey that we've linked in on our school webpage. So the second 30 days that will bring us to our December board meeting and at that meeting the board will be asked to approve the plan. It's in preliminary status right now but when we come back in December we will want that plan to be approved. And once you approve the plan, we have five days to submit it to the State Board of Education, which we plan to do that on December 7th. Are there any questions? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, the feedback that you get from the public, mm -hmm. will that be presented to like the academic committee or board members? We can definitely do that. It's a really short survey. There are only four questions. Um, we're basically asking them to choose what site they're giving feedback because they can give feedback to the district mm -hmm. and to the school. So we're asking them to give the site that they're providing feedback. What um, do they like about the plan? What do they think can be improved? And any other comments that they would like to make. But we can certainly provide that comment to either the academic committee or the entire board. And this will be available on the district website or each individual's? Mm -hmm. So if you go on the district website now, you will see where it says school um, improvement feedback survey. So you can click that link and the survey will be generated. And then if you go to each school's website, the link is there on the main page, and it's also on the tab that says About Us, where they can go. So it's in two places on the school website, but it's there now, and it's live, and it's ready to go. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Next slide, please. So these are a few of the goals that we have in our district plan, and I'm not going to read all of these to you because you can go online and see them, but basically we're talking about our two main goals are improving academics and improving attendance. And when we talk about improving academics, we want to make sure that we're increasing um, student performance in reading, science, and math. We want to increase our ACT scores. Again, we want to make sure that um, schools increase their um, letter grade, their performance grade, and also we want more of our schools to show either expected growth or met growth. We're looking at increasing our graduation rate and also increasing third grade proficiency on um, the RTA or EOG test. And we have our indicators listed in the action steps. How are we going to make this improvement? So we'll continue to provide support to our schools. We'll continue with Ms. Rice leading the effort of desegregating our test data, meeting with our schools, going over those, that data in PLCs, and providing professional development opportunities for our teachers. Next slide. Dr. Whitaker, may yes. I interrupt real yes, quick? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, uh, if you'll go back to that previous slide. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for um, pointing out some of those goals. And I just wanted to mention that these are all aligned with our district strategic plan. So you'll mm -hmm. find these are nested within that plan. Um, so there's consistency mm -hmm. and uh, alignment all the way, all the way through this. Yes, thank you. 
Next slide. And so our second big goal in our improvement plan is attendance, and we're still aiming for a goal of 96.5% by the end of the year. Currently, we're at 91%. Um, and we have our action steps here. We want to make sure that we have clear and consistent communication, two-way communication with our parents and our community. Um, schools are sending home weekly memos to parents. Um, we're having activities to get parents involved. And also, we're making sure that when students are absent, when they begin to um, show chronic absenteeism, that we're having those, the guidance counselors and counselors um, who work with attendance are having those meetings with students and parents. And we're sending those communications home on day three, three six, and nine. Are there any questions? Okay, next slide, please. I'll turn it over to Amy, and she's gonna give you some information on attendance and behavior. Thank you. Good evening, board members, uh, Dr. Winborn, executive team. Um, so, as promised, we have attendance from our month one PMR. We are behind a month, so I'll just share with everyone. In case y'all don't know, we moved to a new student information system. It is called Infinite Campus. Um, it's going to be great. And we are still learning our way through that. And so let me just tell you, Carolyn Buffalo is amazing. She is leading us through this. Um, and she is a fantastic person to do that. She is now working on month two PMR. So this is from month one. It's been approved by the state. It's been cleaned up. And we um, have a district goal of 96.5, but this year, uh, this month one, we're at 93.9, our elementary, you see, our middle and our high. Last year, I jotted down notes, elementary was rounded up to 95. Middle school last year was at 93%, so we're up in middle school. And high school last year was 92%, and we had an overall of 94. So we're about the same that we were, but, with an, uh, but a slight movement up in our middle and high school for that month one. So we just need to continue that trend. Next slide. And here's our behavior. So I think I told you all last month that we were using the Infinite Campus and our teachers and our administrators. It was a little <coughs> frustrating and pulling the data was also frustrating. And so again, Carolyn Buffalo figured out that we can use Educator's Handbook, which is what we have used for years. Our teachers are used to that, submitting referrals. We can pull data from it so effectively. So um, at the beginning of October, we made a shift to Educator's Handbook. And so I have starred, um, you see that little star, it says transition from infinite campus to Educator's Handbook. Some schools did that immediately. They were so excited about it, they, whoop, they dropped Infinite Campus and moved to Educator's Handbook. And some schools were still using a mixture. They had Infinite, some teachers were still putting in referrals in Infinite Campus, and some were starting to use Educator's Handbook. So it's not a perfect data for this month, but by next month we'll all be into Educator's. We've turned it off. No one can put in a referral through Infinite Campus anymore. So uh, these are our referrals. And so last year at this time for the month of October, um, our total referrals for that month were 819, so slightly down, but again, I can't guarantee that because some of it have, may have been put into Infinite Campus. Elementary, which has made the shift, um, was at 243 last year, so we're at 288 right now. Middle school was at 350, we're at 326, a drop there, and our high schools last year were at 213 and we're at 272. In school suspensions last year, um, we were at 312 and OSS was 210. So we're slightly up in in-school suspensions, but slightly down in our out-of-school suspensions. So a total of 518 <coughs> suspensions for October, and last year we were at 522. But I thought you'd like to see what the top offenses are. Um, so if you'll note, out of those 500 and, uh, excuse me, 778 referrals, 130 of them are for tardies. We are following our attendance policy. We are marking students when they are tardy. And so it goes into the system. And it's not put in as a minor. It is put in as an offense. <coughs> um, followed behind that is disruptive behavior and inappropriate behavior. Our school buildings define that different, you know, 
teachers know the difference. Um, so those are our next two. And then it just gets scattered out with lots of different behaviors. Um, days out of class in school, so just know that when we suspend students out of school, that contributes to our attendance. So you'll see that we had 719 days um, for students who were out of school due to out of school suspensions. Any questions? I have a question, Ms. Rice. Mm -hmm. Will any of those excessive targets cumulate to OSS or ISS? How many will, is, is that part of a, a process? It, it can eventually be to in school suspicion. I, I never suspended students outside of school uh, because of tardies what you know the punishment is being in school so that's when you come up with other creative measures of um, we used you know JFW high school we had a solid lunch table I mean that's what I had to do it was just like in an elementary school you've got to sit at this table and I sat with them and so our, our principals at each building try to come up with creative other measures of discipline so that we keep students in class not out of school since attendance is the issue and being in a class on time Miss Rice yes is elementary school treated the same for excessive tardies? No, so um, they are not. So students in <coughs> elementary school, most of these excessive tardiness are, are in transition from class to class. Um, we definitely ask our principals to be creative, even with stu students who in the high school level are tardy to school. Um, but this is like, once you're in our building, you should be able to get to class in five minutes between those class periods. So that's where these tardies are from. And our elementary schools, no. If we keep up with those. If we have to go to an attendance contract, it's a parental focus that we have with those. It's not a student focus. And even in our high schools, it's a student focus because once you're in the building, you can get to class on time. Thank you. Questions? I think that's it. Are there any other slides? No. Ms. Rice, and, um, I just want to thank you for, for this information. And I certainly appreciate you giving uh, Ms. Buffalo, our student information coordinator, a shout out. She's done an amazing job with this transition because it has been, it has been difficult. But I share your optimism that it will, it will <laughs> eventually be a wonderful thing. If anyone get us there, it's, it's Ms. Buffalo. She's yeah. a smart woman. She's, she's good at what she does. So, so Thank you, ladies. Okay. On behalf of our wonderful team lead, Mr. Jamar Perry, we thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, ladies. Our next item <clears throat> is number six, fiscal responsibility, Ms. Hines. Good evening, board members. Um, we're going to start the fiscal uh, section of this uh, meeting with a celebration. Um, uh, if you can pull that picture up um, we want to celebrate Pam Tillotson she is our bookkeeper or school treasurer at um, South Granville High School she has completed um, NC ASBO specialist certification NC ASBO is our professional community in North Carolina Association for school business officials um, she completed the Academy specialist certification that includes a, a, a six, excuse me, 16 courses um, in accounting, financial management, law, included, including legal responsibilities and business offer, office operations. Um, I just wanted to celebrate her. It takes time, and and she did it beautifully, and um, she'll be recognized at the annual conference in February. But so thank you to Miss Tillotson and. Um, to Mr. Farrell for allowing her to attend this additional training. The next item we have is um, an ESSER update. You all requested some uh, ESSER information. Now that we have completed the use of um, our ESSER funds, um, we're just going to um, Ms. Hunt and I will, will share with you an update on, on how those funds were used um, during this period. Um, next slide, please. This is an overall chart. You've actually seen this chart before. Every month you see this chart. This is our overall federal COVID funding. Um, each bar represents a different type of funding from the, the um, the shorter bar you see on the very left, that was the original 
um, pot of funds that we received. And of course, that, that dollar amount is in millions. So that's $1.699 million um, that we received. Um, and we go on that tallest is are the funds that we're, we just completed um, recently, that those are what we call ESSER three. that was the third round of ESSER funds, um, totaling um, just, uh, just under $15 million. Our total expenditures, and of course this is all expenditures, um, is just under $27 million in federal COVID money. Next slide, please. And this is just a, a, a pie chart just to show you how those funds were spent. Um, the, the, the big blue is, is people, that's our, that's our personnel, our salary, and the, the larger red is in the employee benefits. So salary and benefits total um, just about what is it, 76, 000, excuse me, 76 percent of the funding, um, which is, is in line with what we've been reporting. Um, you can see that purchase services are 4.4%. Um, Supplies and materials is 13%, uh, so a large chunk. Um, capital outlay, we did just a, a fraction of capital outlay expenditure, and then other costs, um, just a variety of, of items. Um, and that just that's just a summary. Again, this is all of our funding. This is the total 26 million um, that, that, we, um, that we received. Next slide, please. This is, the, um, this is the summary sheet that you guys are used to seeing every month. Um, and this is all of the ESSER funding that, um, that ended on September 30th. We've reported <laughs> on the, our earlier funding, fundings that have expired earlier, and so this is just a final report on our um, ESSER three funds that expired on, on September 30th. Um, you can see that funds remaining um, were approximately 113,000. I do want to note here that you, you'll see some negatives there remaining <coughs> and some positives. Some of that is still, while the funds ended on September 30th, it's important to note that the funds had to be encumbered by September 30th. And there is what, what they call a liquidation period through the end of December. So when, so again, some of these funds have been encumbered through a purchase order and we'll be making sure that those invoices come in by the end of December. So really in January, we should be able to provide you a final report. Um, those negatives are simply there because there are times that we put in a purchase order um, a little bit over because we wanna be sure that we spend every little penny um, that that we need to that we can and you know we'll we'll cover the other with other um, the the remaining funds we'll cover with other funding available. Um, that's just a, the general bird's eye view of that funding. Miss um, Hunt is going to go into more detail with each of those ESSER funds. Good evening, everyone. Mm -hmm. So the first PRC we have is 181, and this PRC, as you can see, was $13 million, and it was used to pay for our positions such as custodians, assistant principals, nurse, attendance officer, and receptionists in some of our schools. We also used it for summer programming staff and for summer bridge for our secondary schools that were not Title I. We also had to use these funds for mileage, for transportation, as well as paying for our bus drivers hiring bonuses that we did for the end of this at the beginning of this school year and then some of the supplemental software items purchased were canvas google workspace and gizmo which is science which is our supplemental science curriculum next slide this 183 and 184 is our homeless one and two prc which was seventy five thousand dollars a portion of this funds were sent to pay for our mckinney vento homelessness salary supplies that were purchased to support the program, transportation costs if we had to transport any students from schools. Also, we are sending a team to the National Association for the Education of Homeless Children and Youth Conference to come back and train the rest of our support staff here in the district. And as you can see, there is a balance of $27,217.57 from this PRC. Next slide. 
This is PRC 188. This is our summer career accelerator programs with our CTE department, um, which was used to pay for CTE teacher salaries. Also, it paid for our summer internships where we had our so students working during the summer in different areas. Also, the Math Reality Works is a math program that was implemented in the summer, and it will also continue to be used for our eighth grade students. And we used all of those funds. Next slide. PRC 189, we have $161,000. This PRC covered a software program for after school tutoring and math grades three through eight. And the balance left on that was $2,184.25. Next slide. PRC 191, this one is for grants for identif identifying missing and locating students. This PRC, we did not use any of the funds for this because mm. some of the PRCs you have, there are stipulations to how you can use it. And this was one of those, so these funds were reverted back to the state. The next slide, 192. This is our ESSER three funds for cyberbullying and suicide prevention. Their cost was $72,000. And in this, our technology department, we use these funds to purchase software for Neptune Navigator. It is an online digital citizenship curriculum to teach students how to be smart and stay safe online, as well as we have the learning.com, which we purchase for our high school students as well for safety and digital citizenship. And the balance in that budget is $6,249.51. Next slide. 193, this was to purchase software for Gavel, <coughs> which is the online safety software, and the balance is $3.35. Next slide. 195, this is our Leadership Institute. This PRC was primarily only for Northern Gravel Middle School. Um, these funds came in because of their designation, so they received $84,000 in funds. Um, they purchased. Um, for a coach, they had a coach to help with their new teacher support at Northern Granville. They purchased professional development for their staff. And also, they purchased um, books this year for a book study to work on with their teachers and to provide professional development. Next slide. 198 is National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. We have $81,000 in those funds. These funds were allocated for teachers who applied and passed the National Board certification. Um, we recruited and tried to get as many teachers as we could with these funds to be able to reimburse them. The balance that we have is $59,321.51. I have a question or yes. comment. When we say we have a balance, that's what we did not use. And am I correct in saying that it's not when you don't use it in its for a specific category, you can't just switch it to another category. That is okay. correct. Just to make, kind of make that clear for our audience. Yes. This PRC is for $2,461 for driver's training, and this was just funds to give for the driver's ed teacher to provide behind the wheel driving instruction during the pandemic. The next slide is 206. This is our principal retention supplements, and these funds were for $10,000, and it covered the salary and benefits for the principal and teacher supplements. And the last slide, do you have any questions? <clears throat> Ms. Hunt, how were y'all able to identify those kids for McKinney Vento? How did you process with that? So there is a process for McKinney Vento. Mm -hmm. So when we find out students um, who are identified, we do send our social workers out to make sure they are identified for McKinney Vento. Mm -hmm. And then we do keep up with that because we do have to report to the state, which is mm -hmm. coming up in December, how many McKinney Vento students we have in the district. <coughs> Can you give me a number of how many we served last year, this previous school year? Um, off the top of my head, I will get back with you on that. Do y'all ever maybe contact DSS, families come in there sometime who they are homeless, those kids bring to school, is, that's a, a, is that a resource as well y'all may have used in our district? DSS is, you know, sometimes when those families go there, they have kids that go in our school system, mm -hmm. so. We have, we have been, we have had contact from them, but most of it comes from in-house. They will let the school know and the school will let our team know. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Thank you. Ms. Hunt, if you would, before you leave, I, I want to publicly thank you for all your work in managing these, uh, these funds. It's, it's, it was a huge amount of, of money with a lot of different strings attached, and you did a fantastic job of making sure that it was spent uh, correctly and appropriately, and you followed all the rules uh, that the federal government uh, passed down to us. So thank you so much for your hard work. Thank you. <laughs> it's a difficult job, so I, I share that. So thanks. Uh, the next item we have on um, to present this evening is um, what has become an annual event now is the Supplemental Funds for Teacher Compensation. Um, next slide, please. This, this funding began in 21-22, um, and what we have since found is that this is a recurring appropriation, and we, we've been able to count on this from year to year. It is designed to support low wealth and small counties um, who, who the counties who typically cannot provide the local supplement that other larger counties are able to provide. Um, and this, these funds are designed to support that. Um, and it, of course, the board has to approve the distribution of those funds each year. Next slide, please. For 24-25, our total allotment is $1.2 um, $1 million. And DPI tells us the maximum each eligible teacher is able to receive, and that is 2,147. Again, that is the maximum each individual is able to um, to receive of this funds. And what's important to note is that these funds are designed and only permitted for certified and instructional support personnel who are classroom based, um, not the district level um, employees. Um, this is for K-12 only, um, so pre-K teachers are not eligible for this, um, this funding. Um, what's been critical is this funding cannot supplant other non-state supplemental funds. Um, basically, this is not a replacement for our a funding source for our local supplement. It is, it is supposed to supplement that. Um, and so this is salary. It's, it's related to, as our local supplement is considered salary. Um, it is subject to retirement. But we can, we can decide as a district how those funds are going to be distributed. Next slide, please. And for this year, I would, I, my recommendation um, and the recommendation of the committee, this was discussed at the Finance Committee, um, is to fund the additional 2% supplement for our classroom-based certified teachers and instructional support. This is approximately 600,000. Um, I, I want to back up for a second and say that this is, we've used this previously on top of our local supplement. Um, what we have found is that um, because the, the county did not fund our additional 2% that, that we have allotted for our classroom-based teachers, is, is this funding is designed for that purpose. That additional, and that's why we would like to use this funding. It is not supplanting our current funding because the county's not funding this. Um, so this would be an appropriate usage of that state supplement for that uh, to take care of that additional supplement um, and then at that point that's of course you see that that's costing approximately six hundred thousand when we have 1.2 million available um, the remaining funds uh, i would we would recommend to use as a one-time supplement to be paid in march up up to the maximum amount allowed for each eligible teacher um, and of course because pre-k teachers are not eligible for the use of these state funds we don't want to penalize them because they are teachers in this district um, we would like to use those fund eight dollars that we've used in the past for those pre-k supplements does anybody have any questions <coughs> about this So just to be clear, mm -hmm. the, lo the supplement will stay at 12% total. Correct? correct, yes, except for any remaining funds that we have available. Right. But, okay, that's 
I just want to yes. Make so sure. and, and to be clear, this is for classroom-based certified teachers and instructional support. Those are your classroom teachers. Those are your social workers who are classroom who are school-based. Those are your counselors. Those are your school nurses. Um, those are the, the main recipients of that additional 2%. And it perfectly lines up with what we said we were going to do for this additional 2%. It's those classroom-based um, certifieds. Do you think that this will be <clears throat> something that's going to be renewed annually? Or is this a one-time? Do you think this is a one-time? I was hesitant in the beginning. We first received these funds in 21-22, very hesitant, but it has um, been renewing. Now, what's important <coughs> is, is our all allotment for these funds is based on the county's position, right? It's, it's based on our low wealth, so our funding amount changes every year, and we can't predict that. Um, so, so that, and that's why the board has to decide how to use these funds each year. And so this is my recommendation for this year. This, I mean, of, of course, I mean, this is a great recommendation. Um, I just, and I'm not opposed to it at all. I just worry about using, and this is what it's meant for, mm -hmm. the supplement. I just worry about the current situation that we're in and um, continuing to give supplements. May, may I clarify? And I hope this, this clarifies. Yeah. This 12% we're already giving. Oh, I, oh, already I know. Budgeted. Oh, I know it's, are, already, right. it's already budgeted for mm -hmm. the year. No, no, no. no. Mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to it at all. Okay. Like, of course, I want them, you know, I want our classroom teachers to have it. Sure. Um, of course. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. just, and the additional amount again, we we would just be maximizing the use of the funds because if we're getting the funds from the state, we want to use the funds from the state. And the only way we're allowed to use them is as this supplement. The, the only thing I'm referencing is the future position that that this would put us in. That's mm -hmm. all. It's not mm -hmm. it's not this current recommendation at all. The future position, as in the next budget season, if the county commissioners again don't approve two percent, if this isn't re you know reapproved for the following year then again would we would be in a very similar situation as we were for this budget season where we would be dipping into fund balance that we don't have correct to pay for the additional supplement correct that's that's yes. all that's my worry that's all i share that concern yes okay mm -hmm. however this does this does support our budget this year um because you know when when the budget came out mm -hmm there was still a question of what this <coughs> supplant meant and because one never knows what DPI is, how DPI is defining what, what these things are. So we, we needed to get that information. And so they released a lovely calculation spreadsheet and some very direct terms that indicated that we, so we could prove, I could prove to make myself feel better that this is not supplanting um, those funds. So in our in our budget i mean that's budgeted in our local fund balance it, it, that 4.1 million dollars that we're using in fund balance that 600,000 is sitting there so that's actually a savings in our fund balance as well you said that it's tied to low wealth county mm -hmm. however does it have any effect if our adm varies well absolutely okay. yes if 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 our adm drops then we we lose funding Any other questions? This comes to you as a recommendation. Motion to approve recommendation as presented. Second. Motion's been made and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? There's no opposition. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hines. Mm -hmm. The next item we have on um, the agenda is our budget amendments, and they are, they are light this month, um, which is a, a lovely reprieve. Um, the first you'll see is our local fund uh, um, budget amendment. Um, we were just, uh, 
the use of instructional supplies purchasing uh, for, uh, uh, excuse me, curriculum instruction needed to reallocate some of their funding and that, that's the purpose of this budget amendment. There is no additional funding in this, so the budget remains at $24,216,000, um, $24,216,788. And the next amendment is in our federal grants. Um, if you remember correctly, not all of our federal grants have been posted. Um, however, some additional had been. Um, we are adding the um, 017 CTE funding, um, just an additional $11,092 that was allocated. Um, we are also updating in this budget amendment the 21st <coughs> century um, community learning centers budget, moving funds, um, to cover the cost of some evaluation services that are required for the for the um, for the grant, um, so again we are adding eleven thousand ninety two dollars to the federal budget, which leaves our federal budget total um, at two million one hundred ninety four thousand three hundred seventy three dollars. Any questions about the budget amendments? They are presented for your approval. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No, no opposition. The motion passes. Thank you. All right. Um, next you'll see the budget review in, in our fiscal update. Um, this is the, the standard um, budget review that you see. It's important to note that this is through September 30th. At that point in the year, we're 25% through the year. So you can see that our local and our state budget is in line. Um, uh, so we're doing well in that st on that front. The federal budget, again, don't panic. There's, a, there's negative simply because DPI has not yet um, approved, fully approved our budgets. They have been approved on paper. They just haven't given us the money yet. So um, we haven't been able to post those budgets. Um, but we hopefully that will be happening very soon. Um, other restricted, again, you see we're in line, um, pointing out that our capital outlay, we have used half of our capital outlay funding um, for the year. So it is, it is mostly gone, um, which we just need to keep that in mind um, as, as uh, capital needs come up throughout the year. And then, of course, our community schools and child nutrition budgets, which are also in line for this time of year. Any questions about? The budget at this time okay next item we have is board travel <coughs> um, uh, the budget for uh, for the boards and I say board travel I said it again it's professional development is travel related to professional development um, so I have to adjust that um, our, the 24-25 budget for this purpose is $7,000, and expenditures as of um, September 30th um, are $1,335, leaving you a balance of $5,665. Any questions about anything listed on there? Um, I think we should be getting a, a refund for that yes. seven, correct? It, it, so yes. <laughs> That's an inflated number. I think it's already come in, actually. Okay, It'll I'm, be I'm probably be posted. 30, so, yeah, uh, yes. Just yeah. For, yes, you're right. To know. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right. Um, I'm just going to, he's, Mr. Connor is, is bringing up the COVID funds there. Um, we've already talked about that. This is just the report in the, in the format that you see every, every month. And again, I just want to note the liquidation period. Um, at this point, there's, there's not going to be a lot of change through January. So you will, you will get excited. Um, you will not see this report until January, until we have fully liquidated the, these funds. Does anybody have any questions about those COVID funds? Yeah, the, the 113,000 will be lower a number when we get the final report. Um, no, I expect it to be right around that area. Um, that, that, that's, those are funds we simply were not able to use for the purposes they were required to be used. So, so you've done all you can? We have much. done all we can. Yes, the, the, the encumbered funds are listed, are included in those total expenditures. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you. you. That's a good question. Thank you. All right. 
Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank very you, Ms. Hans. Thank you. Our next item is item seven, health and safety operations facilities. Um, Dr. Winborn, we'll let you start off with 701. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just for everyone's benefit, um, there are four documents here. Um, two, of course, are the actual final studies for everyone's reference. Um, and these have been shared multiple times, um, but I wanted to make sure they were here in case anyone needed to pull them up and, and look at them and refer to any of the, the data. Um, I also have, once again, a copy of the 2024 school reorganization planning and timeline. But I'd like to maybe just start, I put together a, a very brief uh, presentation just to give some a historical perspective, kind of a reminder on how we got to where we are, sort of a, a big picture look at um, not just this board, but previous boards um, work around this issue. So Mr. Connor, if you would pull up uh, GCPS, yep, that one right there, historical perspective. And <clears throat> I thought maybe I would, um, when I started thinking about this, I, I felt it was important to go back to a turning point in our school district. Um, you'll go to the next slide, Mr. Connor. This graph here shows the average daily membership, or we say ADM as the shorthand. This is, these are the number of students that are enrolled in our, in our school district. And right about 2010, 2011, there was a shift. So if you looked at years prior to the first year there, this red line was pointing in the other direction, or it was more or less flat, but going, growing. Um, you know, there was a natural sort of growth in Granville County of school-aged children. It wasn't a great deal, um, but there, we were sort of the only, the only game in town. And uh, things changed with our legislators and the introduction of charter schools. And it really began to change around 11, 12, and shortly thereafter when the state removed the cap or the number of charters that were allowed and started uh, to have many more that, that opened up. And so many of our students uh, exercised, their families exercised the choice and, and began moving to other schools. So anyway, you, you can see that was sort of the tipping point. Um, and we've continued almost virtually the same uh, slope on that, on that chart ever since. Uh, next slide, Mr. Connor. So I thought I would point out, you know, what, is, what have previous boards done around reorganization and closure? So I, I went back and just made sure, checked the dates and everything, and this is, we, we had sort of two big clusters of action. There was a lot of discussion, a lot of different scenarios and iterations have been examined. Um, so, but these are the actions that were taken. Many, many more other uh, things were studied. And we even had some actions that were reversed, if some of you may recall. But these are the ones that, that stood. Uh, Joe Toller Elementary School, Joe Toller Oak Hill Elementary School, Mary Potter Middle School, and JF Webb School of Health and Life Sciences High School were all closed in the spring of 2018. That was the last school year that those uh, were in existence. And you can see the numbers of students that were enrolled at each of those schools at the time they were closed. And then that last column just shows what happened with the campus. So the board, the boards, plural, I guess I should say, because it's, it's different members at different times, um, they, they closed four schools and um, really only one of those campuses was actually sold. Um, however, we did essentially repurpose one in the form of moving Hawley to Creedmoor, and we have since, well, we are on the cusp of deeding that over to the county. So next slide, Mr. Connor. So the, the, there's that same first slide with some arrows around the times that those actions were taken, or less, or more, at least those decisions were being made, approximately. 
Holly did not move until, I guess, a year later. But <clears throat> you can see that it, it you know, these, these decisions, the board is, has grappled with these decisions over a long period of time. Next slide, Mr. Connor. And I've added here some numbers. If you take the benchmark year at 2011-2012, and you look at uh, that very first blue arrow as you're going from left to right, when Joe Toller Oak Hill, Mary Potter Middle School, and JF Webb School of Health and Life Science were closed, we were down 1,026 students from 2011-12. And the decisions that the board made only repositioned the district to be down 336. So it, it only took care of about 700 students. We were still in the negative after all those decisions were made. And then if you move further on down the slope, the time Creedmoor was closed, we were down 1,653. And adding the closure of Creedmoor, it still only got us to negative 674. So we were still behind the curve. This work still needed to be done to get us back to uh, kind of that original tipping point that occurred back in 2011. Next slide, Mr. Conner. So over the past 14 years, these are some important points to think about. We've lost 2,252 students. We closed four schools and we reassigned 979 students during that time. So that really only netted us to negative, we're still negative 1,200, almost 1,300 from where we were before. So all those four closures really didn't get us that far. Um, it resulted in a transfer of ownership to two campuses, and that, that is Joe Toller Oak Hill and former Hawley. So we didn't really lose that many campuses. We still have a lot of carrying cost. So of course we have all the corresponding loss of those students, plus Let's not forget, we added a school in 2018, Gramble Academy, which has netted us some students coming back. But it's, again, it's on the, it's on the ledger. It's on, the, it's on the, the balance sheet, so to speak, to, to think about. Plus, we know that the cost of personnel continues to rise, as Ms. Hines has showed us again and again and again. It's the snowball that won't stop growing not just salaries, but benefits. The cost of health care, the cost of retirement that the district has to pay. That continues to, to balloon. Plus, the increased cost of operations, cost of fuel has gone up, the cost of utilities continues to rise. Our, build, our buildings and facilities keep getting older. Our maintenance obligations grow. Plus, this corresponding reduction in our fund balance that keeps happening. So, and I'm not trying to paint a picture of doom and gloom, but I want everyone to sort of understand very clearly about, you know, the, how we got to where we are. Because it didn't happen overnight. And it, it, it happened through uh, many different factors all coming together over a long period of time. And with many different board members and many different total boards, all grappling and struggling with this. So next slide, Mr. Connor. <coughs> So obviously, these are things I, I know that you all know, but I'm, I'm also speaking for the benefit of the public listening. You know, we are facing significant shortfalls for this year's budget. This potentially could be the greatest year of fund balance use ever. I, I, I went back, and Ms. Hines might be able to contradict me, but uh, I couldn't find uh, where we had budgeted more than this year. Um, our ESSER funding, which was welcome at the time, that's gone, and we cannot use it um, to float our needs uh, because of our inefficiencies. You know, costs are going up, and um, the, as a result, the opportunities for our students are being restricted. So, <laughs> all that being said, um, I thought it, it, it would just be helpful as a reminder. I, again, I'm not trying to um, 
cast any blame by any means. I know that um, some, many of these things are, have been out of our control. They've been very difficult to manage. And um, previous <coughs> board members have struggled and worked very hard on this. Previous administrations have, have done so also. But yet, here you are all tonight uh, facing some options. I'd like to go back to what you said about when charter schools first came about, there was a limit of 100. That's and correct. that has been removed. But we have a unique situation, at least I think it's unique. We border Durham and Wake Counties. And it's not just our False Lake, not just our Ranch Charter or Oxford Prep. It's over 30, isn't it? Schools Science. that we send 36. money to. 36. 36. And it's unlikely that, those, it's likely that those numbers will increase. So, Ms. That's Williams, thank thing. you for bringing that up. I, I, when I went to, I mentioned that I went to visit Surrey County, which is further west. Mm -hmm. um, it borders, it's a county that borders Virginia. They have, um, I think about 8,000 students or so. They're, they're a little bigger than us. They're about the size we used to be. Um, but they only have two charter schools that they send children to. And a lot of that has to do with geography and proximity to metropolitan areas, as you pointed out. So not, we are in a unique position in the fact that we've, we've lost so many children to charters because of our circumstances. And seeing, you made a valid point, seeing as how there's no cap anymore, in all likelihood, we will continue to. I mean, because, I mean, Wake mm -hmm. and Durham are not getting any smaller. They keep growing. And so, in all likelihood, there will be more that pop up. And that just means that we're going to continue to, to leech students. I mean, how's that? I just hope we can hold our own <laughs> at this point. Because population growth, if you have the more charters, and more, well, now it's not just charters, it's um, private schools. And homeschooling. And homeschooling, yeah. So. Any other questions, board members? Uh, Ms. Connor, if you go to the next slide. So again, just as a reminder, back in um, late summer, uh, well, August 5th, to be precise, you approved this timeline <coughs> to address um, your latest efforts to, with, with regard to reorganization. And I'm, I'm pleased to report that we've, you guys have done an amazing job of sticking to this schedule. Uh, we have satisfied and followed every single item um, on both sides of the House, administration and board members. And so we find ourselves at the last row, uh, November 4th. Um, we're, we stand ready to receive any final questions you may have. Um, and then, of course, you can deliberate and take whatever action you feel is appropriate. Could you address <clears throat> for the purpose, I know you've addressed it with us, but for those listening, when we say the academic opportunities for our students, what they've been missing and what they might be able to get with the consolidation. Yes, ma'am. Um, and I'll try to sort of summarize what's yeah. included in the studies, but it essentially comes down to a economy of scale, so to speak. If you, if, if you take the number of teachers that we have spread out across three high schools right now and simply put them into two buildings, that expands not only the numbers of sections of core classes that you could have, more math, more, more math classes, more science, more English, but you can offer more honors level courses, AP courses, You'll have more elective teachers, more career and technical education teachers to offer a wider variety of courses to those same students. And you'll also have more teachers in the arts, so you could have multiple disciplines there, more sections of foreign language. Um, it also could help uh, improve opportunities with extracurriculars. Athletics could be more competitive. You could have full teams. Um, JV teams as well, and it just, it sort of goes on and on and on. Um, there is a point when a school is so small that it, it just really hinders and limits 
what we can offer the students during the school day. So to me, I mean, I know that the money is, is, is a huge driver here, but to me, the outcomes and opportunities for our kids is what really um, I'm focused on. Stan, one of the things that <clears throat> comes to mind when you talk about a school getting too uh, small to operate efficiently, what happens when a system gets that way? Because that's, that's where we are headed. Yes, sir. I mean, if you think about it. Yes, sir. Not only Granville, but a lot of small system in the state with the choices that people Absolutely. have and the amount of funding that we are getting, uh, somewhere down the road, what's happened to schools going to happen to systems. Uh, so, I mean, and the rate we are going, based on my observation, and the money we, funding we get from the state and especially from the county, uh, being that I've been around for a long time, and schools have never gotten the amount of money that is needed to operate. And when you do that in my 35 years of being around, I mean, we've come, we've come down a long way. Uh, and by looking at where we are now based on where we are 30 years ago, uh, we're not going to last another 30 years because we're going to have a system with enough not enough funding or kids to open one school at a elementary or middle or high school. I mean, if you look at where we are right now, you know, over 2,000 kids gone, and that's a lot of money gone. Uh, and you, we talk about the uh, numbers coming to Granville County, <clears throat> the number of houses, development, all that good stuff. But you, you know, a kid don't come with their house these days. <laughs> uh, and, and people don't look at that part of it. But a, a household worth $300,000 with one kid pays the same amount of taxes it paid with no kids or 10 kids. So, I mean, we can't look at it from that perspective only because the funding is going to come. So the question becomes, what, are, what is the county commissioners going to do with that extra funding they get with, you know, 15, 20,000 more uh, people in the county. Uh, right now, I mean, in the past, they haven't given a lot up to us. Uh, and uh, we, you know, we can blame a lot of things, but uh, they have to be in that blame game also. And I, I'm just concerned, you know, I, I have a few uh, great grandchildren that just, just getting started. So I plan to be around a long time, seeing that they get what they deserve. But the fact is, I want every kid in the system to get what they deserve. And uh, it's going to take funding to do that. And at the rate we are going, I'm just concerned that uh, we are not going to be able to exist for so much longer as a, as a system. Now, that's something to think about. Yes, sir. And I think um, there are certainly some of our, our neighboring school districts have already uh, yes. felt this. Um, you know, the shrinking enrollment. Vance County, I know, has had to close many schools. Warren County Schools is in a crisis right now. Um, so they're continuing to shrink and, and close, try to make their footprint smaller so they can maintain their quality of their services. So you're right. It's something so to we, think about. We are in a real dilemma right now. But it's going to get worse, potentially. I think our General Assembly is going to have to dig deep into their hearts and souls to look at how we want to educate children in North Carolina so that all children have an opportunity for a good education. Well, I, I don't think the General Assembly's heart is in public education. Uh, there's a lot of other places that uh, people have opportunity to go and do. Uh, I mean, you look at the history of what's going on in the state of North Carolina, I mean, a lot of things that the General Assembly do, they don't do it with public school in mind. And I'll 
preference that by saying that's my opinion. I just want that child that lives, just for an example, in northern Granville County, drives, rides a bus a long ways already. Maybe mom's a single mom, or maybe she's not. Maybe she's working full time, struggling. School choice is not going to do her any good. And we've got to be sure, as a state and as a county, that we provide for every child because the cost of education is small compared to the cost of a child not getting an education, what their future is. But that's my opinion, I think. That's something <coughs> as a state we have to look at. But you're right, we're not, we're not unique. School closures are happening all across this country. I just wanna add a couple of things with regards to that. Uh, I definitely agree with your thought process, uh, Mr. Pete. Um, and yes, things are probably going to get worse. You know, you just see that. And be it basically, you know, what's happening uh, with our legislation and everything. I think it's just been noted, you know, more and more on uh, TV that things will probably, you know, get worse than better. But if we are here, to do what is best for the children, Granville County school system. You know, I, one of the things that I have to be concerned about when we, if what we've been looking at and what we have been going through this process that you said with the description and the notes that what we've been going through and trying to reach a decision, but then when you start looking at the other major factor right there on the board there when you start transitioning those districts and pushing kids this way and that way, you know that pushing kids all the way to South Granville, next to Wake County, and pushing kids from JF Webb, which is all the way to the northern counties, you know, that, you know, that's what some of these parents are saying. Hey, I'm not sending my kids from Granville Central closest to JF Webb all the way over. You know, I'm just thinking about the line. And that's going to impact families a lot too. And they've already said that. You're pushing from one end to the other end. Because think about it. From one end, JF Webb, South Granville, all the way to the other end. See, we have an extremely large county. We are yes. only just a few square miles smaller than uh, Charlotte, um, yes. Mecklenburg area. Yes. But our kids are so spread out. <coughs> they are spread They're out. very spread out, which involves transportation, schools, how long do you want to keep people on buses, that type of thing. Yeah. I don't think we'll ever solve the bus problem because I think we just, that's just going to be, always have some long routes, but it's, if you were in a county, say the size, I guess, of Warren, and you had the same number of kids, you could yeah. easily have one this, one that, and one, For sure. so, a smaller county. And, and another thing. And I actually used to spend quite some time, and this was before the board, because when I, when I came on the board, but before that, out at um, Chotoli. And you know that's way on the northern end, very much so. And then that was closed, you know, and now, you know, the kids then were separated between two of the next two uh, closest schools. I was talking about the elementary schools and everything. But yes, we are, you know, very large. Well, for now, we have to do the best we can with what we have in the circumstances we're in, so. Right. Madam Chair, that concludes my remarks, so I'll okay. turn it back over Thank to you, you for deliberating. I guess we'll, at this point, go around and anyone has any questions that they or concerns they want to bring up. <coughs> Mr. Peace. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of concerns. Uh, and, and I don't know, I, I, I need to get through this so I can go back to sleep at night, number one. But because the idea that, you know, and I look at it from a, from a financial perspective, number one, and, and, and I look at where we are as a system with fund balance. 
from one year to the next. And uh, we, uh, we started out at 23, I think, with about $7 million plus. And we're going to start without consolidation. We're going to start in 25 with about $1 million plus. And uh, we can't operate a system like that. That's why I said earlier on that if we don't do something, and this is just a, I mean, what we want, need to do now is just a piecemeal of where we're going to have to go at some point, where uh, the board's going to have to go at some point. Uh, so, you know, I'm a bottom line kind of guy. And there's no need of, you know, going all around the world to get to where you want to go when it's right down the street. And uh, right now, we got to make a decision about what we are going to do. And, and I've looked at or tried to visualize what's better to do than what we or what I've been considering or we've been considering doing at this point in time. Now, you know, next month, next year, sometime might be different. But I can't, I don't see no way we can go into the 25, 26 school year without doing what we are about, what we need to do. I don't know what we're about to do. And that's to uh, make our footprint a lot smaller at a lesser cost. Because somewhere between now and then, we got to come up with whatever it's going to take to get us from where we are to where we need to be. And uh, if we're going from basically, uh, we're losing for about $4 million or more dollars uh, in our fund balance and that we, we've been using to sort of get us over the hump every year. The hump's not there anymore. So, you know, I, I don't, I really don't. That's my, that, that's my spiel. And I, I would like to hear somebody else uh, put me in a better place than I am right now. Yeah, I mean, I think um, going through all of this over the last, I feel like I've, we've been pouring over this for the last four, four years, some of us. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and I've, I've mentioned this in like way early on whenever we first got on the board and started talking about all this stuff. But um, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and we, I graduated from a high school that had just under 4,000 kids in it. But after looking at our town and where everybody was bused from, looking at those maps, it was probably just the blue area that those kids were located. So if we were looking at consolidating all three high schools to one, that would be about the size of the high school that I came from. Um, but the size of our county, it's just not feasible as far as getting kids to where they need to go, which is unfortunate. That being said, um, having graduated from a high school of that size, I can attest to the amount of opportunities and course offerings that we were presented with. I remember going into my freshman year of high school and you literally got a binder of all of the different classes that you could choose from. And it was separated by, you know, freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, senior year, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and that kind of thing. And I graduated, and I probably would have never become a musician because I, it had I gone to a smaller school district, because I had choir and band and orchestra and all these things at my disposal, and it was amazing. My brother, then after I graduated, my parents moved to Buffalo, New York, and my brother attended a high school that was um, similar to some of these charter schools that we have. And he said that he was so deflated because we, he had gone, he had attended high school his freshman year at the same high school that I had attended. And then when he went to Buffalo, he said he um, got the one page piece of paper of electives that he could choose from. And he was so frustrated because he felt like he had gone from the world is your oyster, there are so many possibilities to, sorry, we only have this. 
and this is you're being pigeonholed into what you can do for the rest of your life. And so he was frustrated. So my point to all of this being that I know that consolidation is challenging and I know that it's frustrating. At the same time, having come from the other extreme, I see so many more possibilities that will be available to our students and, and things that will prepare them for their future in ways that they may not be aware of. Um, so that's where I'm at. Thank you. Dr. Lindsay? Well, um, maybe someone can help me uh, recall, remember. I know we need two high schools in our, in our dist district here. So I'm thinking about now the old and the new. Why are we deciding to close the newer school to make it a middle school and leave the older school as a high school? I know South Grand is older than Grand Central. I, 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 help me understand why we, we are choosing to keep that school open and turn a high school into a middle school, since that's a newer school. It's based on capacity, the, all the lines being drawn, that's not possible. I can't remember how, how we're making the decision. I'm very confident. I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I, I can't speak for, for board members and the motions they've made. I'm sorry, were you going to speak? After you. All I was going to say is I think the main driving force was geography. Um, just based on bus routes, based on where they were placed in the county from a just literal physical location perspective, I'm fairly confident that was the biggest reason. I mean, I, I'll, I'll say it. We, we did vote to close South Granville High School and move the, the high schools to Granville Central and Webb. And here we are again. Did, you did it and then undid it. We did it and then we and then it was voted to be undone. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's what I'm right. saying is and yeah. now here we are again. So I mean <laughs> that we've been down that road, yeah. sadly. What's the cost? I know I know it's South Ground needs some repairs done to it. Dr. Wimborne, the board members here. What's the cost of getting that school up up to up to up to snuff? This cost, the cost of getting, I understand there's some repairs that need to be done at South Ground. Am I correct? So I'm wondering if you're bringing this up because so many people at the public hearing were making references to um, how much it would cost to renovate South Granville and Jail Webb. But for me, those schools are going to remain open irregardless because even if we were to turn South Granville into a middle school, it would still need those renovations. Mm -hmm. So it's not a net savings to do that option instead of the one that we're considering now. That's a, that's a null argument. Because irregardless of whether we leave South Granville as a high school or if we turned it into a middle school, it would still need the exact same renovations that it does right now. And so it doesn't matter, I mean it does matter because it's a large amount of money, if it's five million or 10 million or 20 million or whatever astronomical number that we don't have. And the same for JF Webb, the same thing could be said. You know, if, if we were to consider JF Webb as a middle school instead of a high school, they would still need the exact same renovations and upgrades that they do now. And so if the argument is about money, it's not a valid one mm -hmm. because those doors are still gonna remain mm -hmm. open at all three of those campuses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me anyways, right. that's my, that's right. my perspective. I, that, I did hear that a lot. Right, yeah, that's why I brought up here. I wanted that we make that, that decision and we think more about that. Right. Since it's the newer school, I, you're right, I know it's not gonna shut that school down, but I was wondering why we decide to, um, to um, not keep Grandma Central, the newer school, as a high school. And of course, I'm sure we'll probably find something to do with South Grandma as well, but since. Yeah, I also felt there was, a, um, there was one really um, valid comment that was made, I think it was, um, something along the line, and I'm totally paraphrasing here because I don't want to misquote anybody, um, that if we turned Granville Central High School into a middle school, that it would be the nicest middle school in the state. And um, one of the things that we've discussed is that middle school seems to be the level that we lose the most students. 
So they sit, they come in into our elementary schools a lot of times, and they get they get to fifth grade and they they take one one look at our middle school situation and they're like, nope, and they head out to Wake Prep or Falls Lake or whatever one of those 36 charter schools or private school or I know some of them homeschool through middle school. Yeah. And so my hope, my personal hope, I'm not speaking for anybody else on the board, is that maybe if if we do give them the nicest one, because somebody else very validly they they stated. What are you going to do to get students back in the seat? Give them the nicest campus. Well, the building does not make the school. It's, it's the place that they come to learn. If, and it's going to take the to staffing, all those things that make the school inside there. The building, you're right, it's very, very nice, but it's not the building. I very literally have neighbors mm -hmm. that would not send their kids to the former J.C. Hawley campus mm -hmm. because of the state that it mm -hmm. was in. And they, they, more than one, I think I have four in my neighborhood alone that were at Tar River. And then they took one look at the GC Holly Middle School campus and they said, no way. And they left and they went to Falls Lake and Oxford Prep and Wake Prep. So yeah. it, it really, it really does happen. I promise you. Yeah. It really, no, I get what you're saying. Yeah. If we were to get them through the door yeah. and, and that, you know, that, you know, we have those great educators and we have that great school spirit and we have that school community. I mean, yeah, they yeah. would hopefully stay. I did. Yeah, I worked there, it was a great school. It, it was, I, mm. that's yeah. why both my boys went. Right, it's right. because it, it was a great school community, yeah. no doubt. Just as my concern, um, just, I just tell me what's yeah. going to my mind. And just to add to that, you know, one of the other things, and I think it came from the study as well, with regards to you know, all of the additional land at Grandville Central versus the other schools. You know, there, I know maybe JF Webb has a little extra more land, but I do not believe there's any additional, uh, you know, as far as uh, South Grandville. Any? If, if, if I may, actually, to that point, yeah. if you don't yeah. mind. Um, so something else, again, this is going back to my previous high school days. Um, our campus was split. Um, one side of the road was 910 and then the other side was 1112 and um, they decided to completely get rid of the 1112 campus and it's now like they built up instead of out um, and so I mean I, I do want to bring that point as far as like SGHS or web are concerned I mean it's we don't it doesn't have to be all one level in order to be able to expand the school Dr. Frederick. Um, I mean, gosh, I don't know what to add to everything. I mean, similarly to Amanda, I had a very different high school experience growing up. We only had, the town that I grew up in was about 26,000 people total, and there was one high school publicly and one private high school. So there was no competition. Everybody went to the same thing. There was the robust offerings. Um, that we're striving for but were very different than what your experience was. I didn't have a binder. I had like 10 or 15 things, right? Um, so, I mean, I, I've, I'm sensitive to the small town feel because I grew up in a town of 1,100 and the town that I went to high school in, we had to commute like 20, 25 minutes to get to. Um, so, I'm, I'm sensitive to kind of a lot of the different arguments and I see the opportunity because that's kind of why I went to that place. There was no charter schools back when I was going to high school. so. Um, there was no other option. I just went to the one that made the most sense uh, academically. So um, I think I just don't want to anchor and, and reiterate the point that all of us have said, but like none of this is easy. None of this is something that we want to do. We're doing this out of necessity. We're uh, not ignorant to the challenges. We're sensitive to the commute, to the choice, to the finances, to all of those things. Uh, we're just trying to do the best with what we got and do what we can to accomplish what Dr. Winborn is saying. We're, uh, by consolidating it increases opportunity and uh, to acknowledge what Mr. Peace is saying. I mean, there are oncoming challenges that we can't predict and that we um, can do only our best to try to prepare for. And that's kind of what we're trying to accomplish right now. And when I made the motion, uh, whatever, several months ago, um, my big thing was saying that like, this is the most obvious geographically uh, from a choice perspective. And if somebody has something creative outside of that, I would absolutely love to hear it. And I haven't seen anything wildly compelling that overcomes that challenge or that portion of the equation that changes this to not seem like the only logical uh, path moving forward. 
So while nobody likes this, including myself, um, it is what, I mean, I guess the thing that seems the most likely has been the only option that's been deliberated for several months. And the most important thing is success, is the success of Granville County Public Schools, not one physical location. And um, I think that's the most important thing, is making sure that every decision we make, what we've been given, is an effort to make sure that our, is that GCPS has the best opportunity that it has in years to come. Ms. Sanders. Well, uh, definitely what he said, you know, we, we have to focus on what is the best thing for the children, you know, for the Grand Family Public School System. And um, yeah, this is going to be based on, you know, our funding and based on what we're gonna get and it's gonna continue to go down, as Mr. Peace said, it's gonna, it will, you know, and three or four more years we'll be in the same. We could be right here again, three or four more years, you know, trying to make a determination to do something again, you know, to, you know. So really, we'll find ourselves back here again uh, if things keep uh, growing down. And as you know, uh, with how many charter schools we have now? 36? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that can, and there is no limit to that. We know that we're losing what, 103 for this school year. We've lost 103 students. And we have had from the public hearing, if we make do this as far as in redistricting and everything. Some parents said, forget it, I'm going to go ahead and take my child to something. You know, we're just, what, deja vu? Like you and I, we started here in 2021. There were some studies done and laid out there and first decisions and here we're back at the table again. Madam Chair, according to the time line that we have before us. Uh, we need to either make a decision tonight or decide that we are not going to and what that means. Uh, and if I could, I would like to just say a word about that. Uh, if we don't make a decision tonight about what go, what's going to happen with Granville County Public School System next year? Uh, I, I see our superintendent shaking his head over there already because uh, he's going to have a task, and we're going to have, or you all going to have a task, and we're going to have a task that we can't, that we're not going to be able to deal with uh, because you're going to have at least 6,000 children out there with nothing to do and nowhere to go because they ain't, we're not going to have no funding to send them anywhere or do anything. Now, everybody knows, that's around this board, know that we don't want that to happen. And uh, so, I, I, you know, I think, you know, if we're going to make a decision tonight, and I think we need to, we should, we pretty much have to decide that we are going to <clears throat> do what's before us as it relates to uh, consolidating to these schools, or we're going to leave this place not knowing what the hell we're going to do from here on. Ms. Hayes, do you have any comments? Oh, no, I'm, I'm with Mr. I'll just add this one thing. I took a look at our numbers in our kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and third grade. And I pretended that those children would all stay with us in high school. And I also pretended that we wouldn't lose any of them and we wouldn't gain any more. And we're still, if you take it and go that far, we're still lower than what we are now. So it will take a lot. It would take something short of a miracle to turn it around to the point that, and I just don't know, I'm, I'm like Mr. Peace. I, 
it keeps me awake at night. It really does. I have a granddaughter in public school, and I want her to have every opportunity as well. And I want all of our children to have that opportunity. But the truth of the matter is, every service we provide costs money. Every building our children are in costs money. And I don't see a way we can avoid this hard decision. The growth in the county, I think it will come. But at the same time, like I said before, with the new school choice program and the increase in charters, private schools, and so forth, um, it would take a tremendous amount of growth over the next five years to even stay where we are. Not to mention 10 years. I used to think five years we'd be fine, but the birth rate's down. And I think Dr. Ham told us, if I'm not mistaken, that that new subdivision out on 96, I don't think he picked up but two or three kids from that one on the school bus. Now, he could be some more going, but it's not happening the way we would like for it to. And I would be more than happy to see in five or 10 years that Brown County Public Schools is sitting down there at the commissioner's office at their board meeting and we need two new schools. That would be wonderful. But in the meantime, we have to deal with reality and we have to deal with what, what we have and make the best choices for the children. The thing that strikes me, I'm like someone said, the academic portion of it. You know, if we can offer more to our students, we may retain more. We may get more. We may not. But we have to try. So that's my thinking. Does anyone want to discuss any specific part of the studies or any of the comments that our board, our public speakers have made at the hearings or tonight? We don't respond to them, but if any of the subject matter that came up, we'd like to respond. I think we did address the fact of geography and transportation. That's a bugaboo, always. It was 30 some years ago when I tried to route handicapped buses, and it's still a bugaboo. I believe there was a, um, a statement made about the validity of, of our motion to um, I'm glad you brought that up. And so I would love for Ms. Duvison to address. She did with the board, so I know all right. of us know, but just so that it's on the record and people in the public can know, she could address that. Sure. I think the question was about the, um, procedural, the procedural rules for waiving board policy, which even more. The board did um, to post notice of the public hearing and um, just to note that the Board of Education follows Robert's Rules of Orders um, unless there is a board policy on that point. And the Granville County Board of Education does have a policy that a majority of board members can vote to waive a certain policy for a certain purpose. So that's why, that's why that was handled the way it was. Thank you. And thank you for bringing that up. Any other comments, questions? <clears throat> and just on a personal matter, my, my grandchild will have to be driven further to school. So it's an inconvenience to a point. It's not one we can't overcome. And, you know, but like we say, we've got kids riding the bus a long ways already, and we, we have to keep that in mind. Board members, if we have, uh, well, I think we've spent enough time. <laughs> uh, because there's, there's a decision that has to be made. And while I don't know if everybody wants to, be comfortable about making a decision, but you know, 
when we got on this board, it wouldn't, we knew it wasn't going to be all roses all the time anyway. Uh, but anyway, I, I think, you know, I, I've studied this and figured out that what we're trying to do here is the best thing that I see for us to do based on the situation and the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Therefore, I'm going to make a motion, if I'm in order, Madam Chair, that we uh, proceed with the consolidation efforts that we discussed, and that is to close Greenwood Central High School, move the kids to way up in South Greenwood, <coughs> close. G.C. Harley and Buttons, you know, middle, and move those children to Granville Central High School with the name change of Granville Central High School to become Granville Central Middle School. That's my motion, Madam Chair. Second. Motion's been made. You second it. Any more discussion? Let's do a round the table vote. Ms. Faith? Am I here? Yes. Mrs. Aye. Brett? Aye. Aye. Ms. Anderson? You want to pass? Yes. Ms. Hayes? Yes. Yes, and not with some sadness. The motion passes. Madam Chair, may I uh, just ask for a point of clarification? for the benefit. Uh, this is for the 2025-26 school year. Correct. Yes. The next item on our agenda is... Madam Chair, mm -hmm. may I? Sure. I, uh, I feel like I need to say that this decision, that, this motion that I made, I think it's for the betterment of uh, the system, the children of this uh, county, and I know that uh, there are people out there that's going to be upset, concerned, angry, and uh, I can handle all that. Uh, but I would appreciate it if it was directed toward me, if there's some out there. Thank you. Okay, move to item 702. This was dependent on the outcome of the previous item. Attendance zone realignment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna ask uh, Assistant Superintendent Ms. Courtney Curran and our Director of Transportation, Dr. Chris Hamm, uh, to lead this agenda item. Um, and the majority of this information, in fact, did come from our, our committee. Yes, so. uh, and that's what I was going to state. Um, this is information that Dr. Ham presented at the operations committee recently, uh, and the operations committee came up with a recommendation, but also wanted everyone to see all of the information. So Dr. Ham is going to present all of this to you. Good evening, board members. Um, We'll just get right to it. As we'll do this as a review. Um, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to ask. So when the proposals came out, we were asked to look at possible boundaries for uh, different scenarios. So back at the uh, work session, I believe in September, I believe, 
Uh, we came up with these different options, and these options were vetted with Kevin Hart, who's the head of ITRA at NC State. So we started looking at possibilities to make a balanced um, boundary between the two high schools. So this was the first option that we came up with, and just for a point of reference, uh, this uh, boundary includes to the east the current South Granville boundary that you see there in blue. Um, it heads down Highway 15 to where it takes that right. That is Hester Road, if you're familiar with that area. It eventually heads over towards Old 75 and ends up there on Range Road where it kind of heads back up there in the very western corner. So essentially in this option, South Granville picks up the Butner area and JF Webb picks up the STEM area. And this gives us uh, an option where we're the closest in terms of being equal in our numbers north and south. Next slide, please. And we went over these same uh, pros and cons, and I said then uh, the cons are going to be a lot the same for all the options because we've talked before about my concerns just with the bus situation. Uh, Ms. Williams, you said we're not going to solve the bus driver situation. I fully believe that myself now. So um, these are those same pros. It's the most balanced of the two options. There's no issues with building capacity. It does leave you some options for school choice within that, those parameters. Um, a lot of these cons are the same. Um, we won't have a matched middle school, high school feeder pattern. That's important to you. Um, I do envision some routes being longer. Um, we may not be able to share buses. There may be an option to do that in some, some situations. And just the general staffing concerns to make sure we have bus drivers in places uh, for these schools. Next slide, please. Um, we wanted to look at a different option. So we came up with an option two, which includes uh, coming down that same Highway 15 there and then heading to the left on Hester Road coming out on Highway 56 and heading over to Franklinton. Um, so that is this option here. Um, next slide, please. Look at the, the number here for the balance of high schools. It was cut off on that last screen. But if you look under cons, that's where you can see the, the balance between the two schools. Right. So con there, they fit, but not anywhere near as, as well as they do in the first option. And some of those same, uh, same cons, just thinking about how far south that option does go to try to even get to these areas. What we end up with, and we've talked about geography several times, is we have a lot of land in the center part of the county, but not a lot of people on that land. So that's why these lines have to be drawn in such a way to uh, meet certain criteria. Next slide. There was a third option, which when the uh, committee looked at it last month, they decided it wasn't viable at all. It was the least viable of, of all of them. So we have tabled that um, option. So you have two high school options. And now we'll go ahead and look at middle school. So in middle school option one, this uses all of our current middle school boundaries. So the red there, which is the Northern Granville Web area, that is their current boundary. There's no changes to the Northern Granville boundary at all. And what it does in the south is it takes our current Holly Middle School and Butner Stem Middle School boundaries and combines them together. Next slide. So your pros here are it does utilize our current boundaries, so it has the least amount of impact on students in terms of assignment. Um, the feeder patterns between our elementary schools and middle schools don't change. There's no issues with building capacity. Um, again, no impact to Northern Granville at all in terms of any changes of boundaries or anything like that. The cons, some of the same ones. Um, there is a disparity, and when we looked at some other options, those numbers didn't really change either, just going back to geography and where people live. Next slide. And then we do have middle school option two. This takes us down Belltown Road to that same uh, old 75 and then out on Range Road. Next slide. 
And it was interesting as we looked at this different option, it only netted a difference of six children from one option to the next. And the rest of the uh, cons are basically the same. Next slide. So at that October 23rd operations committee meeting, uh, board members Hayes, William, and Peace reviewed these options and is their recommendation to approve high school option one now that the decision has been made previously. And it's also their recommendation to approve middle school option one. And I'll be happy to entertain any questions that you have. I mean, small question, but I'm assuming the disparity with the larger middle school would be in the southern half? Yes. Yes. Um, I don't know that I have any questions, but um, I feel fairly confident that if the three members on the operations committee feel that this is the best option, then I'm happy to make a motion that we approve it as presented. Second. Motion's been made in second. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I may. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, one of the conversations that came out from the operations committee was, you know, how to proceed contingent upon a possible decision tonight. Hence, uh, we had scheduled a work session for next week. The purpose, the sole purpose of that work session will be to create three different plans. The first is a student reassignment timeline and plan. We must let our families know as soon as possible about where their children will be assigned next school year. Um, we also must work on the school choice or transfer window um, and how that will work um, because we know we at the high schools may have some capacity issues. The second thing that we need to uh, determine is a staff assignment timeline and plan. Um, we need to resolve the student assignment first because the enrollment will dictate most of the staffing conversation. About The staff will follow the children, more, more or less. And then finally, we'll also need to have a timeline for the facility uh, transfer, you know, making sure that the facilities are ready to receive students. Um, so we've mocked up some, some of this information already just to ch try to get prepared because it's such a quick turnaround. So we plan on bringing that information to you on Tuesday. We're going to work on it this week. And then we'll, we're asking for your guidance on implementing these procedures. Again, our goal is to try to make this happen as quickly as possible and in a very transparent, open, and fair way so that everyone is informed about the process and um, everybody understands and can clearly see how we're, how we're doing this. Of course, our work sessions are open as well to public to attend. Uh, that is next Tuesday, um, November the 12th, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., or longer as if needed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next, we have number eight, which is our human capital management. Ms. Klein? We don't have any updates um, because we are waiting to have more guidance after that um, November 12th meeting. Okay. All right. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? So and then after that, if it's approved, we'll take a, about a 10 minute break. So moved. Second. All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Thank you.
We have, we need a motion to approve the personnel certified and classified exhibits presented in closed session. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve certified and classified personnel as presented in closed session. Second. Motion's been made and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> the motion passes. We do have a lot of events coming up. The 12th, obviously, which was mentioned earlier, the Board of Education work session at 4 o'clock. Uh, the 19th, Finance Committee meeting. 20th, Policy Committee meeting. Thanksgiving holiday, and then December 2nd, regular meeting. Uh, may I, uh, there are some missing committee meetings, so I would ask Austin, if you don't mind, because I think some of them have just been made in the last few days. Just kind of get committee meeting lists because there are a bunch of them and send it out to everybody so we have that. Can I ask while we have board members right here if, if you guys have a preference before um, before or after policy for um, legislative meeting on the 20th? On the 20th. I don't think it's going to take very long. I, it looks like our policy meeting is not until okay, 1130. Okay. 20th. Yes, ma'am. So if anybody... I, I would prefer to do it at 1030, but I'm, I'm open to after if you guys have a preference. Is that on a Wednesday? Or Wednesday? I'm sorry? Do what at 1030? Yes, ma'am. Uh, legislative to draft a letter about um, teacher pay or a resolution from our board. Are you good for 1030? Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> we get those great schedules from Austin every Monday. That's fine. Okay. <coughs> Okay, Madam Chair. If there's nothing else. Madam Chair. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to add also um, <coughs> December 2nd is our regular board meeting, but at 5 p.m. we're going to have a reception here at Mary Potter, Mary Potter in the lobby to honor our outgoing board members. Um, so please uh, put a hold on that. And we'll have some hors d'oeuvres and uh, a dance off. <laughs> and not not really. But <laughs> uh, I just want to. <laughs> I'd like to know if we can hang around for the pizza. <laughs> that you volunteer for. <laughs> but if you'll please just put a hold it for five o'clock, and we've invited uh, other elected officials, local elected officials, to attend as well. So please bring outgoing board members. If you'd like to bring any of your family members by or anything, feel, feel free to join in the fun. Okay. All right. If it's nothing else, do we have a motion to adjourn? So move. move. Second. Second. <laughs> okay. We need to know who made that motion. I did. <laughs> who seconded it? She seconded it. Okay. She seconded Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.